Hello, my name is Niall Finneran. I teach Historical Archaeology and Heritage at the University of Winchester. And welcome to this Citizen webinar. I'm channeling my inner Jonathan Meads and I'm bringing this to you from the seaside at Tynmouth. What I'm going to be talking about today is basically some material that I wrote about in a paper in the International Journal of Historical Archaeology a couple of years ago, which looked at the archaeology of the English seaside resort experience. And I used Tynmouth here as a case study. Um, there's lots of interesting things we can kind of play around with here. So I'm going to be talking to you about that. But in addition, I want to sort of develop some of the work that we've been doing with Citizen. I've been working with Citizen for, for four years now with uh, Alex Belisario, Lauren Tidbury. Here comes a train. You'll hear it going past the background. Um, Therese Cairns and, and Grant Betterson. And um, we're all geeks. We, we love maritime and coastal archaeology. We love sharing our passion for it. Um, and I think the thing that I'd like to try and highlight during this talk is, is the mundane stuff, the really odd, the weird, the stuff you take for granted. And I'm going to be taking you on a sort of little tour of some of the key sites here in Tynmouth as we, as we have a look at that. Um, originally, this is going to come out live. I was going to try and do all this live, but given the fact that it would just be me walking a lot, um, it actually works far better if I pre-record this. Um, I'm sitting watching this now with you and I'm available to do some Q&A afterwards. Um, so yeah, we're going to go on a little geeky tour of Tynmouth and we're going to look at an archaeological angle of it, as I wrote in my paper. But also we've got some other considerations to think about and those considerations will be thinking about um, the impacts of climate change, coastal erosion on, on heritage and so forth. Let's just swing away from me now shortly and I'll, I'll give you a little overview of, of what we're looking at. Okay, now you're not seeing me, you're seeing the view, which is far better. Just to give you an idea of where we are, we're on an east-facing coast in South Devon here. You're looking up towards Exmouth and Bugley Salterton there, you see the red sandstone cliffs. And as you pan around here, you're following the sort of contour of Lyme Bay, looking in the farthest little bit into Lyme Regis in Dorset. The white cliffs you see there are a beer head, um, East Devon. River X is tucked in sort of a bit further on to your left there. Um, and as we swing around out to sea, just give you a couple of cruise liners going around in circles out there in the, the Covid scare. Now looking towards Torquay, there's Babacombe there. And then as we swing around, that's towards Tynmouth down there, that's Shaldon, the other side of the River Teen. So the river sort of comes out down there just beyond the pier. We're going to walk along there, we're going to be heading in that direction shortly. But I just want to start off talking to you about a really important heritage asset that I'm standing on here and this is the way into Tynmouth. This is the railway line. Now this railway line is really important because it's the main link between London and Plymouth and Penzance today and back in 2014 it was cut by a very severe storm. Repair jobs it's always been at the mercy of the weather you can you can just see it's, it's, it's a very exposed. Also the big issue is cliff fall too you can see the cliff so the red sandstone is very very soft above it and back into the 1920s, 30s, 40s and 50s, Great Western Railway, British Rail, Western Region, used to slope those cliffs. And you can still see the angle of the cliffs shows that sloping. Those cliffs also have an awful tendency to slip onto the railway line too. And Network Rail are going to do something about it. They're basically going to realign this railway. I'm standing on something called Spray Point, which sticks out into the middle of the sea. And they're going to realign the railway roughly in a straight line from that tunnel there to where I am now. And it's going to take out that beach, but also it's going to take out the original sea wall that you see here. Now, this is a really important sea wall because it was designed by a very famous Victorian engineer who had a cigar and a stovepipe hat. It was called uh, I.K. Brunel, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And when the South Devon Railway was opened in 1846, and it was a, a track that ran on the old broad gauge, the old seven foot and quarter inch broad gauge, they weren't steam trains. These trains on here were sucked along the rails by atmospheric pressure using something called the atmospheric method. So there are a series of pumping houses along the, the, the way here that used to suck air out of a tube that ran down the centre of the railway lines and a piston went into the tube and these trains had no steam traction at all. Now if you look at that, that is a piece of Victorian engineering that is not going to be around in the next few years. We are currently having a lot of consultations here locally about what to do about this. And it's going to come down to the sort of fact that we enjoy our beach. There's a lot of important Victorian industrial heritage in there. But additionally, it's at the mercy of storms and we can't afford 
to have this aurel link cut off here. Now what we're going to do now, having just talked to you very briefly about the, the seat wall here and, and what it looks like, we're going to carry on walking in this direction and I'm going to carry on down there towards Tynmouth Resort itself. And I'm going to show you a few little bits and pieces there from an archaeological angle and from a heritage angle that I think are really important. Again, you can find most of the stuff that I've written in my paper in the International Journal of Historical Archaeology where I go into a little bit more theoretical depth. But for now, enjoy the view, and next time I see you, it'll be down by the railway near the station where I have an excessively geeky thing to point out to you. Just before we get down to the station, I thought I'd treat you to this little bit of view as well. I've just come from the other side of Spray Point, and this gives you a, a sort of feeling for the sort of size of beach we've got here at Tynmouth. Um, it, the beach extends all the way beyond the pier that you see there, the pier built in the 1860s. We'll get a closer look at that shortly. Um, you can see the, the town down there and the village, the other side of the estuary of the River Teen is Shalden, um, the red cliff there called the, the Ness. Um, there's a few little bits and pieces of um, World War II archaeology along here. You won't be surprised to learn a couple of pillboxes. Um, Moving along the coast over here, as I say, this is Babacom and, and Tor Bay in behind, a quintessential big English seaside resort. Anyway, that's a, just a nice little bit of view there. Let's keep heading on down. So here we are down at the railway bridge just by Timmer Station. Just a quick scan over the horizon there, take it in. It's a nice summer's evening here. Um, my first bit of geekery, and I've said that we're geeks, archaeologists, I mean, you know, people like Grant and Therese and myself spend time hanging around muddy creeks in South Devon looking at bits of old wooden boat and getting very excited about it. But something I want you to try and get excited about, maybe, it's a forlorn hope, but trust me, this is quite fun. What you've got down there is Timber Station, and you can see there's one platform here that is much longer than the other. I'm just going to walk down a little bit, and you'll get a sense of this that the platform on your left-hand side, the down platform, which goes towards Plymouth and Penzance, is much longer than the up platform to the right-hand side, which takes you to London, to Bristol, and up country. And now, archaeology is all about the material culture reflecting people's behaviour. And this is a perfect example of this, because the reason you've got a longer platform going down implies that there's some differential in traffic, that you're getting more focused traffic that down platform isn't really used to this extent anymore. It's, it, it's relatively, you get a few stopping trains from London, but it's mainly local services. But back in, say, the 1940s and 50s, in the post-war period, when this resort was at its heyday, you were getting, in the morning, lots of trains coming in in one go. And if the platform was short, the trains were very, very long. So what had to happen was that they would draw up, let the people off, and then carry on again, let some more people off and carry on again. They couldn't get the entire train on the down platform. So what they decided to do was lengthen it so you could get the entire train on, you could let everyone off at once, the train could carry on and you could get more trains and more capacity in in the mornings in the down direction. What does that mean? Well, it relates to behaviour really of, of the holiday makers and the fact that people wanted to make the most of the first day of their holidays. They would travel all night, very early in the morning from north of England, um, London and so forth and there, there would be lots of trains scheduled to come in the morning into Tynmouth to get people off. They couldn't book into their boarding houses until later on so they wanted to come down make the most of their holiday anyway and that's what they did. Um, on the way back though you found that people were more leisurely, they had more time so they could spend the day on the beach, they could go early if they wanted, there wasn't as much pressure on the up platform. So there you go, there's a nice little bit of geeky archaeological theory there. I was writing my paper on the archaeology of the <coughs> English seaside resort with reference to Tynmouth and here we are on the beach, closer in now and you can see the pier. One of the things I wanted to try and get captured was not just the sort of physical remains here, the beach, the pier, we've got the groins, the sort of management for the beach, the way that men of humanity has got to portrayed the landscape. I wanted to try and get something like the, the senses, the feelings, the smells, the sounds. You can hear the sounds now. I'm rather glad I came out to do some filming here because it's a beautiful evening with people in, swimming in the sea. It's the whole raison d'etre of a seaside resort. Coming here to swim, take the waters, the meat the point of culture and nature, if you like. 
idea of something called phenomenology, which is a philosophical study of the senses and why we kind of do as we do and what we sense, you know, sort of study of human perception. And that's what I focused on. Now, here we are along the beach here, and one of the sort of theoretical ideas I was playing around with was the notion that a seaside resort kind of captures, encapsulates the meeting point between the natural and the cultural, and that's what we've got here. Nature on the left-hand side, this sort of huge expanse of sea there, mediated by the promenade. Promenades are important features of the English seaside resort, and many seaside resorts. They mark the boundary line between the cultural and natural landscapes. Promenade, the idea of, comes from the French word promenade, to walk. You walk up and down along the promenade, it's where you are seen, it's a, it's a space for social action. And that's really important, it still is today actually. We'll go and have a, a look up on the promenade and see what's going on up there. But from the point of view of this theoretical idea of land and sea meeting, Seaside resorts are, by their nature, places where land and sea meet, and where humans come to enjoy, encounter, and experience the sea, the swimming, but also other places too. We call this a liminal space, it's on the edge, it's a place between land and sea, and there are lots of things going on here. Look, up here there, that goes out into the sea. As you walk along the pier, you're physically surrounded either side by the sea, it gives you a certain sensation there. When I was a kid, there used to be a ballroom on the end there. And that sort of degraded over the years. There used to be a landing stage as well where day trippers used to put in too. Now it's a, a sort of amusement um, arcade sort of place. The piers are really, really important parts of our seaside heritage and I, I hope we value them more. The thing about Timber Pier is it suffered very, very bad damage in the 2014 gales that took out the sea wall that I mentioned earlier the very beginning of our, our journey through Tynmouth and um, you know these are very very fragile structures well actually not so much it's quite interesting that the bits that tended to survive really well dated from the 1860s so the old Victorian screw piles that go all the way down through the sea through the sand and are screwed into the bedrock underneath it's actually a solid looking construction there are lots and lots of piers that need our help across the English seaside. So let's enjoy them while we've got them. So having had a little bit of a theoretical think about the meeting of nature and culture and land and sea and so forth, let's move on up to the uh, promenade and go and have a look at some of the archaeological pictures of the English seaside resorts. OK, we've come up now onto the promenade. Out the sea it's a bit quieter. Bit of a breeze tonight, seagulls, people taking the air, walking along the sea as they've done here for hundreds of years and we'll just give you a little bit of a panorama here we're going to take in the seafront here in Tynmouth lots of nice old Regency buildings to the left here it's a really quite nicely preserved seaside resort and some more modern developments there uh, the pavilions St Michael's Church in the background Harris Church of East Tynmouth and we do a full circle come back to the pier that we looked at earlier um, just gives you a feeling for, for what the resort is all about. Now, I talked earlier about this notion of the separation of land and sea and a sort of theoretical idea there that the promenade is the meeting point. And there's the promenade in Tynmouth there. And the promenade was designed really as a place that people would go and walk along and be seen, see and be seen. Uh, social in interactions were really, really big in the early days of English seaside resorts. Let's have a little bit of a historical context here. I mean, I've, I've been throwing some archaeological ideas and some theoretical ideas around a bit, but let's, let's think about the sort of historical background here, what's going on. Seaside resorts, as I've mentioned, are very, very functionally specific maritime communities, like fishing villages or docks and harbours and so forth, and Tynmouth had that. Tynmouth was originally a fishing village back in the, the earliest sort of records of East and West Tynmouth go back into the Saxon period. It became a single town in the sort of medieval period and made its money from the Newfoundland cod industry. So, so people would sail out in the sort of 16th, 17th century, there's the River, the River Teen over there, they'd, they'd sail out and go to the Grand Banks, exploit the cod, and some of the local mariners here um, actually had families over in Newfoundland as well. Uh, there's a pub here, the New Key Inn, used to be called the Newfoundland Fishery. So, so Timworth was built on fishing, and to some extent it is still as today. 
and, and other industries. We'll, we'll come to that shortly because that's important about our little chat about heritage here. Um, but Tynmouth really became a sort of phenomenon of the English seaside resort starts really in the um, 18th century. And the, the mania for taking the waters saw this sort of re-emergence of Bath as a spa town, Buxton, Matlock, Droitwich, but also seaside places too. It became fashionable for people to come and get cured, take the cures by swimming in seawater. And that's what the focus was coming down here. It's a very sort of upper class thing to do. And Tynmouth was relatively well set and relatively prosperous. It built on its fishing industry, as we can see around here as we swing around. Um, the structure that you see there is now a, a retirement home, but it used to be called the Royal Hotel, which is one of our biggest and brightest hotels in Tynmouth. Back in the heyday of this place as a resort in the 50s and 60s, they were all hotels along here. And the Riviera in front of you, I remember it was a kid, it was a cinema, um, but it actually started out like as the assembly rooms. That's where the well-heeled in the 18th century would go and do their ballroom dancing and various things like that. Um, so, so all of Tinder still bears the imprint of the society days of the early phase of the seaside resort here. Now, into the 19th century, of course, what happens is that the seaside becomes a more democratic place. At the end of the 19th century, people have more disposable income, they can take more holidays. We start to see a different cross-section of people coming to the English seaside resorts. Um, and this is the case here in Tynmouth. Um, it started to become much more democratic and open around the end of the Victorian period. And as a result, there was much more demand for hotels. So these big residences along the seafront here in the Dead Crescent, this is the pleasure ground in front of us, you can see here, it was all remodelled. So the Rose of the Regency period had given us like the, the formal promenade behind us here, and then these luxury residences and assembly rooms and things like that. The Victorian period leaves a, a markedly different kind of imprint on Tynmouth. And what it does is it makes the seaside resort more democratic and these buildings are converted into hotels and boarding houses. And one of the things that I've argued is that you can tell archaeologically the difference between sort of like the integrated hotel and the boarding house and the B&B. And that's something I've offered up in the paper I wrote in the International Journal of Historical Archaeology, along with an analysis of things like catering kit and crockery and cutlery, all the things that sort of combine to give this special seaside holiday experience. It relates back to this notion that I discussed earlier called phenomenology, looking at the senses and understanding the senses and things like that. So in the Victorian period, Tynmouth grows and its railways there. It gets lots of people coming to visit. The real heyday of the English seaside resort is probably in the sort of decade after the Second World War. Again, people had leisure time, they had the money, they wanted to get out, they wanted to sort of come and spend a week by the seaside. This phenomenon, this democratisation, if you like, of the English seaside is, is, is visible elsewhere. I mean, you think about somewhere like Blackpool, the resorts in the north of England. They thrived during the Wakes Weeks. Now, Wakes Weeks were when entire factory shifts from the northern mill towns went on holiday together for a set week, so a factory would shut down, and an entire shift Entire streets of, of, of northern towns would go to, to Blackpool, for example. And then you had this sort of subtle snobbery that used to kick in, that somewhere like, say, Blackpool was seen as a little bit down at heel, but then further north up the Lancashire coast, Morecambe was a little bit more plusher, and that's reflected in the sort of archaeology of the Morecambe seaside resorts there, for example, the Midland Hotel, wonderful art deco piece. Um, same thing's going on down here in Tynmouth as well. I mean. Torquay, which you can't see, it's, it's, it's over there, um, sort of behind Babacombe, always, always kind of saw itself as a sort of cut above a really elite kind of seaside resort. Um, and as the Victorian seaside resorts and the 20th century seaside resorts evolve, we start to get more of the infrastructure, if you like, the archaeology of the hinterland of the seaside resort here with snack bars, there's playgrounds here, we have a public garden to kids to play games on. There's tennis courts over there, there's a bowling green over there, there's a theatre, a cinema, and things like um, shellfish stalls, um, resort offices, um, ice cream the ice cream cone up there sells ice creams and these seaside shelters as well 
So these are all important parts of the seaside heritage. They all kind of combine, all of these little bits and pieces combine to, to form this experience. I think, you know, now in the 21st century, we've kind of forgotten this, but back in the mid 20th century, you know, if you were in an industrial town and you just worked solidly, these, this was the only time you had away. And you had the excitement of the long train journey down when you get here as well. It's, it's indicative, it's really interesting if you look at the advertising for some of the uh, resort hotels here, the sorts of things they promise, the sorts of luxuries that were promised in the post-war period. It's just really, really interesting. It gets this whole idea of the experience across them. It didn't matter if it rained. It, we look at the postcards and we see all of these sunny seaside resorts, but it did rain here. And if it rained, well, you had things to do. You could go to the theatre, the cinema, you could go for walks. So you had all this sort of huge hinterland of experiences tied up. It's not just the notion of swimming in the sea for seaside resorts. The English seaside resort of the 20th century had long outgrown the more kind of um, high class notion of a, of a place for curing people, a place to go and take the waters, fashionable places. So the Brightons, if you like, uh, the, the Bournemouths. By the 20th century, they'd become really quite democratic. Something else I quite find interesting as well that I investigate only briefly in my paper, but I want to look at more. I've just mentioned Bournemouth. Bournemouth's really quite interesting because Bournemouth was and still is to some extent a Mecca for Orthodox Jewish holiday makers. Um, there were two or three really important kosher hotels in Bournemouth. So different seaside resorts had their different demographics and it'd be interesting to see how that kind of all shapes up in the, the archaeology. There we are, this is, the, this is really the infrastructure of Tynmouth as a seaside resort here. Now in the 21st century of course seaside resorts have to reinvent themselves. So places like Ramsgate, Margate, places that used to be just seaside resorts where people would come and stay for an entire week in the summer. Human behaviour is changing. We're talking about B&Bs now, we're talking about destinations, we're talking about cultural events. And my argument is that this huge trend of 200 years of human social history and the seaside resort is not just important in the British context but the European and the American ones too. All of the stuff, all the material that we're seeing here as I keep spinning the camera around, it's all geared towards one thing. It's the enjoyment of the visitor. And I find that sort of quite an intriguing archaeological question, this notion of looking at the mundane. So we spent a little bit of time there talking through some historical context. I'm going to go down now to the back beach in Tynmouth, the old bit of Tynmouth, not really to talk about anything connected so much with the holiday experience but to get back to the origins of where Tynmouth came from. A nice them. windy sunset, it's the Ness the other side, Shalden, that's the River Teen there, the estuary of the River Teen and uh, the tides coming in there you can see the it's a bit choppy there over the bar, you can see the strength of the current coming in there, the village of Shalden over there we're going to turn around and give you a nice looking sunset here as we Look all the way up the River Teen. The River Teen runs um, from west to east. So we're looking west right into the sunset now, up towards Dartmoor. Um, and this is the old bit of Timoth we'll be focusing in now. Look, it's the old fishing village, it's the old fishing part of Timoth that still has some of that old infrastructure left in it. Um, and the back beach are very, very sort of popular area locally for people to come have a barbecue, have a drink and so forth. But again, look at the, you know, the and this is the reasoning that the, the whole thing about an English seaside resort is this again this meeting between land and sea and sea bathing is still really really popular you know this new move towards what we call wild swimming well you know people have been wild swimming or open water swimming for ages there's nothing nothing different about it back in, t in the 18th and 19th centuries though not in fact uh, I've heard that it happened as late as the sort of post-war period in, in Plymouth you had gender segregated beaches and you find this on maps, on old maps you see dividing lines on the beach here of male versus female areas. Um, so it was certainly the case at Dawlish where there was a kind of little railway up at Dawlish with a, a changing area for, for ladies to get changed into. Um, as you swing round here, um, Babacombe is behind the nest there. And if you're actually at Babacombe Beach, Odicombe Beach, you can still see painted on the side of a cliff male bathing area. If you look, for example, at old Victorian maps of Torquay, 
at Beacon Cove, for example, you can see male or female bathing areas, and it's the case in Plymouth. Um, I, I was talking, I was giving a talk recently at Devon and Exeter Institution, and a chap in his 80s came up to me afterwards and he said, I don't know where you get all this idea about beaches being gender segregated as being something that belongs to the 18th and 19th centuries. I still remember it as a kid in Plymouth. So anyway, just a, a little bit of a view here, just to sort of kind of touch upon some other things that I've been doing with Citizen that relate not to the sea but to the river here in Tynmouth. Um, and more particularly trade and the archaeology of trade that underpinned Tynmouth as a seaside resort. Let's just take a quick look along the river beach up here and I can point a few things out to you. The sort of more modern looking development to the right hand side here is on the site of an old boat yard. Um, and further on down, fishermen's cottages. The quay of Tynmouth is still running, you can still see it over there, that's sort of mainly to do with clay exports and so forth. But just about there, where you see that granite building, is the new quay. And the new quay was built to handle the granite trade from the quarries up at Haytor. Now Haytor is all the way up river up there. You can just see a few hills in the distance. That's Dartmoor, and the River Teen comes from there. And the quarries up on Haytor were exploited in the 19th century. Good quality granite. Granite was big in the 19th century with the sort of memorials, graveyard memorials and so forth. People loved the granite. Originally the granite that was really prized came from the northeast coast of Scotland, Aberdeen around there, but Devon granite was very, very highly prized from Dartmoor, which is this huge granite landmass. Um, the, temp the name Templar is associated with exploitation of granite there. The Templar Way is the footpath that runs from Haytor all the way along the River Teen here through Sheldon and terminates down here. So originally, back in the early 19th century, what would happen was the granite blocks cut up on Haytor were put into um, railway trucks and sent down a gravity line on rails made of granite down to the head of the Stover Canal up near Teen Grace where they were popped on barges then came through the River Teen down here to the new quay that was built to handle granite that was subsequently used to build London Bridge, the old London Bridge, the one that was sold to an American businessman thinking he was buying Tower Bridge, so we think. Um, that's the story. But over there you can see a couple of really popular pubs, but also the New Quay, which was a sort of 19th century manifestation of a diversification of Timmouth's wealth, if you like. Um, we've always had ball clay coming here as well. Ball clay is a very popular export from this corner of Devon. It was used as a sort of kind of 18th century knockoff of, of porcelain. Porcelain was very, very expensive. It came from China. Um, locally in Devon, we tried to make our own using this very, very white, fine um, China clay that you get up in the Bovey Basin, which is back up in that direction there on the shoulder of, um, of Dartmoor. But there you are, a nice kind of sunset view for you and a little look at some industrial archaeology of Tynmouth. Okay, what I've tried to do um, is, is give you an evocation of senses, um, sounds, visuals. Um, you can't smell the fish and chips or smell the sea air here. Wish you could. This is what I was trying to get at really with um, what I've been trying to do um, in my studies of mundane and geeky types of heritage and the stuff we kind of take for granted is to, is to really think about the experience and how that's reflected in the ordering of space, and material culture and architectural space and so forth. And I think that's the way that archaeology needs to be going. It's, it's kind of a lot more um, imaginative approach, isn't it? To think about the, the impact on people's feelings and senses because it's something we can all relate to. And we can all relate to the English seaside. It's all part and parcel of our sort of tradition, isn't it? It's, it's kind of makes us. And there's still a nostalgia for the English seaside resort. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, what's going on here economically that we'll, we'll get there. We can, we can kind of make things better for English seaside resorts. That they're going to survive into the 21st century is really important places. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that little walkthrough. Um, I don't know how this is all going to edit together. I hope it hangs together nicely. It's Sorry, I've been a bit of amateur, but this whole point of understanding sensations and feelings is why I've purposefully done this. I've walked out with an iPad and walked around this place, a place I know and grew up here. Um, and it's the idea of trying to get that sensation, that first-hand experience over to you. It wouldn't have worked if I was sitting in front of my PC just doing a webinar. 
So anyway, I will be available now for some Q&A um, live. Um, and so goodbye from the seafront at Tynmouth here. It's a beautiful evening. Um, and what more can we say but wish you were here. Goodbye. First, first question is, how was it? Uh, thank you for taking your iPad out. Uh, firstly, I need to apologize. I'll do a bit more playing with the audio and see if I can get some of those wind and waves down a bit so that we can hear it a bit clearer. Uh, it will be available on YouTube probably next week if I get to play around with it. Um, but yeah, first of all, how was it taking your iPad out and recording on the beach? That's one of the main questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you've got, you can hear me loud and clear, Grant. Yep, can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, okay, so my, my webcam's not working. Um, it's probably the broadband issues this end, but um, yeah, it's the, the wonderful thing about um, uh, iPad is that it's a very kind of democratic um, sort of object. Anyone can go out and you can you can put together podcasts and webcasts. And you know, the thing is, one thing that this exercise has actually led me to sort of think about is how you know I can make more use of this in the classroom too, at university and so forth. And it's it's just it's just a useful tool to have. Um, I mean, once you get over the sort of self consciousness of it and you know, walking around and talking to a screen, um, it certainly gets you odd looks. But actually, you know, it, it, it's a very useful bit of kit. And actually, Grant, thank you for, for turning the sort of rough and ready stuff into something a little bit more usable. It was definitely rough, and it, yeah, it'll get better. It'll be an epic by the end of the week. <laughs> Once I'm a player, but, but, it'll, be, it'll be great. Ben, ben Hur style, yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so on to some of the other questions. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, there's a few people with co connection issues. Uh, one question from Jason: um, How long would it take take a fishing vessel to get from get to the Grand Banks and back in in the 16th and 17th century from Tynmouth? And how would they oh, keep the fish fresh? That's a very very specific question. It's a it's a very specific question that you probably need to ask a sort of a naval historian. But I mean, in terms of one of, the, one of the, the, the fish, of course, in the days before refrigeration, it was salted. So that's where you get salt cod. So a prerequisite of this was that you, you had drying facilities over in Canada. And I mean, one of the sort of somewhere like Ferryland, for example, which has been archaeologically investigated is one of these sort of specialist settlements on the Newfoundland coast. And just to give you a little bit of extra context, the Grand Banks was a huge um, shallow area of sea just off Newfoundland that when John Cabot, the um, Italian English explorer, was was out there in the 16th century, so saw all these huge cod virtually jumping into the boats. So it became exploited very, very quickly, this fishery. And what happened was that the fishing boats, which are large buses and smacks, would set out from Tynmouth, and it's a it's a you know, it's, it's a it's a long old journey of, of of weeks and weeks and weeks, and it depending on sailing and, and and currents and so forth. And they would set up; they would actually have specific settlements manned by many Devonian families over there in Newfoundland. Uh, the the cod catch would be dried first of all, and then it would be salted, and it would be packed, and it would be taken back. Um, and before you would cook with it, you would you'd reconstitute it by adding water. Um, you can still buy salt cod today um, ex extensively, and it's, it's actually quite a big staple, in fact, of Jamaican cooking in the Caribbean. But the, the deal is that when you come to um, rehydrate the cod, you use a lot of water and you change the water frequently. And even when it is fully rehydrated, it still tastes salty. Um, and cod, salt cod in this manner was known, and it's a, a bit, bit gruesome, was known as tow rag. Um, because it smelt like the, the kind of very sort of poor quality foot rags that were used by, by people in the, the, the sort of post medieval period. So, um, yeah, that's, um, that's roughly the background there. There's, there's been a lot of work done on the archaeology and history of the Grand Banks fishing industry, um, and you can pick up quite a lot about it. And it's, it's a big feature of Canadian maritime historical archaeology, too. Um, and if you get hold of the um, new maritime history of Devon, which is a two volume University of Exeter set. There's actually a chapter in one of the volumes on the excavations at Ferryland, and it's, it's worth looking at. But you can find any, you know, if you Google, if you Google Grand Banks fishing industry, you, you'll find a lot on it. So there's, there's a huge amount that's been done on it. Okay, uh, I have an, another question. So consider, how quickly do the seaside towns evolve considering 
obviously in the current situation, we're kind of expect. Do you reckon there'll be a new birth of the seaside town? Because we're not going to be able to travel as much in the foreseeable future. Do you think that the seaside towns can, do they evolve very quickly or do they just stagnate mm -hmm. if that makes sense? Okay, well, you, you've got you've got a series of historical processes going on, and one of the things I tried to show here was how the historical processes are mirrored by the archaeology and the town plans and things like that. Um, you, you start off with a sort of formative phase in the 18th century where it becomes very, very fashionable to take the waters um, to to swim in seawater and to drink seawater, um, and these sort of curative resorts. Um, are, are very much all the rage within the 18th century and they kind of develop from um, existing sort of fishing resort, fishing towns and things like that. So Brighton's a case in point, but, but Brighton struck gold because it became, it became then the maritime centre for the Prince Regent and his core. So, so Brighton had a kind of head start there. And this connection, this connection with royalty is something that you see through a number of seaside resorts too. Um, as I say, there's a sea change in the 19th century, late 19th century to the 20th century, when people, normal people, um, not the aristocracy, but normal people can start taking paid holidays. And you can link that in. There's a big expansion there. The thing that did for seaside resorts and seaside towns in this country really is a phenomenon that starts in the 1960s and 1970s. It's package tours, cheap package tours to places like Spain, other places in Europe means that you've got guaranteed sunshine, the prices come down with charter airlines, you get all inclusives. Um, uh, and it's really, you can really see from that period, someone like Tynmouth, for example, but mirrored on with many other places across um, the South Coast in particular, the hotels start to close. Um, and one very unique phenomenon that I find quite interesting from a social point of view is that a lot of the hotels, the larger hotels are converted into retirement um, homes and the retirement homes are then staffed by a new demographic of incomers often eastern europeans coming in as well it's quite quite an interesting phenomenon we sort of see in the 1990s i talked briefly in my overview about how we can understand different identities in seaside towns and, and that's one of them um and then you also see for example in places like torquay where you, where you have to sort of increase as well in in, in cheaper housing too so really the the, the inside resort was sort of got a good kicking in the sort of 60 from the sort of 70s i guess into the 80s and it was really in the 1990s that elements of gentrification start happen and we start to see a kind of a, a regrowth of it um, and of late a number of seaside resorts have tried to sort of reinvent themselves and you know we're having this conversation now but i recall this conversation being had about 10 or 12 years ago at the end of the last financial crisis around 2007, 2008, where people were wondering, could people actually afford to go abroad anymore? Well, we know that wasn't the case, but there's always talk of renaissance of the English seaside town and the English seaside resort. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's important that they're parts of our history. So I think that's a very long winded answer to your question there, Grant, but, um, yeah, you know. I, I enjoyed it. I think it's interesting because are we, are we ever going to be able to get that balance right between uh, tourism and kind of the problem with the Airbnb and the actual industries at the seaside towns is there ever going to be yeah going to be a good yeah. balance <clears throat> we need you you can't you can't subsist solely upon tourism it's it's impossible as the sole industry and you only have to look at what's going on in Cornwall really to understand this that um, the huge seasonality of the Cornish holiday trade is massive you know now it's being th this sort of year is being talked of as the year with three winters there's going to be no sort of summer to save the, the the cornish tourist industry and that just shows how precarious it is and it shows how much you kind of you do need that underpinning you really do need that underpinning of um you know industry retail and and other services you, you know the, the thought of having something that's just geared to being a seaside resort is 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 not something that is is, is viable here yeah can't be sustained um so there is an interesting question from paul which is you've shown some of the different spaces into which tinmouth is divided which gives it its flavor as a seaside resort can archaeology shed more light on how and why the space was designated and used at the seaside yeah that's a good question i mean one of the things that one of the things i've done 
in in the the, the, the paper that I wrote in the IJHS was I, I took a, a sort of mapping a map regression exercise where I looked at modern maps, historical maps, and I tried to undertake a sort of historical character mapping uh, of each chunk of Tynmouth. And what you can see very clearly, if you if you just walk around and you do something as basic as looking at the ages of the houses, you can pick very clearly the, the original 18th century, 17, sorry, the original 17th century, 16th century fishing village core, which is which is evidenced by sort of large concentration of fishermen's cottages and the like then you can start to pick out the expansion into the regency period really quite tightly where you find the extension of regency period late georgian regency period um, housing which is very very distinctive stuff along with elements such as the riviera cinema which was the um the assembly rooms so sort of used for society gatherings and then you can demarcate by looking at the extension even further outwards the addition of a railway line the addition of um, larger victorian villa type structures that were constructed in the later 19th century to take into account a new influx of wealthier people plus the emergence of sort of larger more um, kind of democrat democratic um, hotels and then what's really interesting that that's quite a stable picture but I did most of this using Google Earth, really, and historical mappings. But in the post-war period, you get a huge expansion of bungalows in the hinterland of the town, and that's not something that's just, you know, just just Tynmouth. You can see it in a number of um, seaside um, towns, and that's that's connected to a really, really distinctive phenomenon. Basically, lots of older people retiring to the seaside, and they're often people who've come from. Um, Midlands towns, northern towns, who've decided that you know, after they've finished working, they will sell up, buy themselves a bungalow, come and retire to the seaside. And you can see all of these phases of development within the historical mapping really, really clearly. Um, you know, you can see other sort of more subtle things such as these huge houses that you get on the outskirts of Tynmouth. Um, you can see from the 1950s, they become too expensive to run as gentlemen seaside residences. So they get converted into hotels. Um, and you can see that in the fabric of the buildings. And you can see their grounds being broken up and bungalows being built on their grounds too. Um, so, so something like Digimap is a really great resource because it allows you to skip over decades from the 1880s or looking at spatial change um, and it, it's not you know it's not massively high tech thing to do either i think those resources are becoming more there's some beautiful resources out there i think i think one of the things that we have done that sits in it during this period is kind of highlight some of those resources because they kind of just exist in that internet space if that makes sense they kind of just it's yeah but um to it, Picking up on something else, sorry to drag you back to the cod fisheries, but um, someone has asked if a, did an architectural style develop out of the people associated with the cod industry from their wealth? So essentially, uh, he's saying we have a number of 18th century cod houses built from the wealth of cod fishing uh, in the Gasp here in Jersey. So there's a guy all the way oh, from yeah. Jersey, Australia last week, Jersey this week. Huh. Yeah, um, th th this, is, this is good. Um, I mean, we don't in Tynmouth, but what you do find, I mean, Grant, you remember we, we did a recce. We, you know, with, with, I ought to just mention here what the Devon, South Devon Rivers project is about. It is looking at sort of the, the archaeology of the three rivers, the Dart, the Teen and the X, all interconnected. So there's a number of themes kind of coming up. And when we were studying, we were looking on the River X there. If you go to Topsham, um, one of the things that's very distinctive about Topsham is that it was a very important mercantile port. Um, and it attracted, it was a lot of trade with the low countries, with the Dutch. And it's one of these sort of odd places. You, you find this a lot in East Anglia too, but Topsham has a, a very distinctive core of Dutch brick gabled houses, um, which, which is really quite odd for Devon. Um, and, and that's one of the few examples I can think of locally around here, where there is a very kind of distinctive payoff between trading patterns and architectural styles but not so much in Tynmouth in terms of what you've got left down here you've got a few bits of um, sort of um, buildings that could have been used as cod storage cellars 
um, and which probably sort of subsequently been used as clay cellars as well, just generic storage buildings. Um, so no, it's, 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 it's difficult to it's difficult to prove that here, but um, yeah, sure elsewhere that does happen. Yeah, I do. I do love. I do love looking at archaeology in seaside towns because it can show you those connections, uh, especially the ones internationally, which we don't think of that often anymore. But like, there's a protected yeah, record just outside of Tynmouth that's uh, believed to be a Venetian galley, which is a very interesting site. Um, there is a question coming back to the clay industry. Why is ball clay called ball clay? Is it as simple as you can make it I, into a? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um... Ball clay. Why is it called ball clay? I haven't got a clue. Um, I think that's a that's a that's a Wikipedia um, query there, isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, the, the clay. Just I mean, the, another point of view is that the, the, you know, we talk about fishing, but yeah, the, the clay industry is hugely important um, locally here. Up until very very recently, there were big potteries in Newton Abbot and at King Stainton, and the um, Hackney Canal at um, Newton Abbot that runs to the east side of the race course and underneath the current trading estate in King's State and much of it's largely filled in. That bit of canal focuses on servicing the clay industry and the, the clay works there, um, whereas the other canal, the Templar Canal, is um, the one that is basically focused in on bringing the granite from Teen Grace um, down into Tynmouth, down the River Teen. But again, another long-winded answer. In short, I don't know what, how all clay gets its name. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry for me coughing there. A bit of water went down the wrong, <laughs> wrong pipe. Um, well, that was excellent. So we're nearly pushing on for an hour. There is a load of questions that we'll probably I'll follow up with people by our email. Um, but yeah, we're nearly pushing on for hours. So I think it's probably a good time to, to call it there, if that's okay, Niall. Yeah, if that's you okay, talk, you got I know that, that I'm very keen on it. As people know, I'm fairly boat obsessed, but I know there's a um, barge up near the motorway bridge in Tynmouth that is believed to be related to the clay industry and that ties it nicely into the Stover Canal and the clay. Well, the clay the, there's another, I, I ought to name check my friend Phil Newman because he'll kill me if I don't. Um, Phil and I were doing some work on Dartmoor a couple of years ago and we took some ground penetrating radar to the um, the, the, the basin, the, the canal basin up at Team Grace where we actually managed to pick up you know, the, the, the granite tramway that runs down from Haytor quarries through Yarna Woods and follows the curve of the contour down behind Bovey Tracy. Um, we picked up bits of the granite tramway down there and actually Phil was excavating the basin there and there are the remains of barges that were just, just sunk in situ when the when the basin ceased to operate. So there's there's an awful lot of stuff here, but I know you, you and me, Grant, are doing the work down at, in, on the River Dart, and I mean that's a that's a that is a wonderful sort of amazing sort of crop of old boats down there. Not so yeah. much clean, actually. It's surprising. Yeah. Well, I, I always feel I am boat obsessed, but I always feel the working boats don't get enough. We always concentrate on warships and various other stuff, but the working boats just don't get that enough love, in my opinion. Okay, well, you're so, right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Carry on. Okay. Well, no, I mean we don't. We don't. There, there are no. There are no warships on uh, on the Teen and the uh, on the X. I mean, is th these are mercantile rivers effectively? But it's it changes when you get on the Dart, of course, and certainly down in Salcombe, if you want to take another South Devon estuary, and of course over in the Tamar, um, I mean, the, 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 the military archaeology there, the military maritime archaeology, there's a huge amount of stuff um, which which needs looking at. Yeah. Yeah, but I suppose that's why I find the subject of seaside towns so interesting, seaside archaeology and heritage, because it's one that we don't really talk about as much. Everyone loves, we always concentrate on, fixate on certain stuff. But we're not yeah. concentrating as much on the seaside. I mean, it's nice. I hope with citizens that we can explore this a little bit more with yourself and various other people. Um, yes, so, sure. Yeah, and we hope, and now we're able to get back out there. So I suppose as we're coming up to an hour, and I can see we've still got still a lot of people here. Um, we're just going to tie it off there. So there won't be um, another webinar in two weeks' time. We're actually going to call this so that we can now go out and do field work. Uh, thank you for everyone that's attended. We are hoping to run a South Devon Rivers webinar series in winter, and that will be a lot more extensive. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you all, and very f thanks to Niall for giving this presentation. I loved it. Well done for getting out there with your iPad. I'm sorry about my dodgy editing. But we will I will try and play with the audio and make it a little bit better. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Goodbye. Good. Thank you. Thank you.